way. So I interrupt at that point the member for I Patterson. I will look forward to continuing my comments to continue after question the time. Thank you. Just a little later. For the information of the House, and in response to a variety of inquiries on the matter, I wish to clarify the circumstances in which I recommitted a vote to the House this morning. I wish to stress to the House that in the series of divisions that occurred during the morning, it was proper that a number of them were one-minute divisions. The division in question was called under the one-minute provision, but given that there was intervening debate, ought to have been called under the four-minute provision, a matter later noted by the member for Dobell. The division did not result in a majority either way, and I was not prepared to exercise my casting vote in favour of my own ruling. As the question of the time for the ringing of the bells had been raised and there was the possibility of confusion, under Standing Order 208, I decided to submit the question once again in division in order to determine the will of the House. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Honourable Member for Dixon. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Employment Services. Minister, can you confirm that your department told Senate estimates last Thursday that it offers a $6 million bonus to Centrelink if they can exceed a minimum quota on breaching the unemployed? Minister, why did you hide this $6 million breaching bonus from the Australian public? And will you now remove the breaching bonus as well as the quota which requires, and I quote, that 60 per cent of job network breach notifications are applied? The Minister for Employment Services. Mr Speaker, uh, as of the current financial year, Centrelink is able uh, to get an extra $5 million from my department if it meets all of 12 key performance indicators. There are 12 key performance indicators. Ten of them relate strictly to service to job seekers. Uh, two of them relate to breaching. The two key performance indicators relating to breaching are designed to ensure a, that Centrelink and Job Network members have a common understanding of what's reasonable behaviour, and b, that Centrelink won't breach anyone uh, without following due process and ensuring that natural justice applies. Now, let me point out, Mr Speaker, that um, Centrelink is able to not meet the breaching KPIs and still get more money, or it could meet the breaching KPIs and not get, and not get more money. So uh, the simple fact is, Mr. Speaker, that Member yet again there are, there are no targets. There are no targets. The number of breaches is not is the not set Dixon. is not set by the government. It is set by job seeker behaviour. And what this government is on about is ensuring that people obey the rules. And what the opposition obviously seem to want is the old days where almost any excuse would do. The honourable member for Mitchell. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister advise the House on the progress with drug diversion agreements with the states and territories? Prime Minister. Mr um, Speaker, I thank uh, the member for Mitchell for this question. It gives me an opportunity to report to the House on the considerable progress that has been made since the COAG meeting in April of last year to adopt a national approach to illicit drug diversion. Diversion means, Mr Speaker, that drug users can either commit to treatment and rehabilitation or take the consequences of their action in the criminal justice system. And when uh, this national approach to diversion was announced by the government, it received widespread support in the Australian community. We uh, allocated $220 million to this initiative, including funds for treatment, education, law enforcement and research. In November of last year, I launched a detailed national diversion policy framework following its endorsement by all state and territory governments. And the approach is built on a partnership between governments, community organisations, health professionals and local communities. It is a very good example of the social coalition at work. In December of 1999, the Minister for Health and Aid Services and the Tasmanian Premier jointly launched the first diversion agreement. 
In May of this year, I announced a Commonwealth New South Wales diversion agreement with the New South Wales Premier, and I launched a similar agreement with the Victorian Premier in August of this year. And the Commonwealth expects to launch an agreement with Western Australia in a matter of days and to conclude agreements very shortly with both South Australia and Queensland. Mr Speaker, can I record my immense gratitude at the bipartisan approach that has been adopted by state governments working in partnership with the federal government to try and make significant inroads into this dreadful social scourge of drug abuse. And can I say in passing, Mr Speaker, that the national drug statistics released yesterday contained the very pleasing news that there has been a significant drop in heroin overdose deaths in New South Wales to a figure of 296 in 1999-2000 from 491 the year before. Now, Mr Speaker, that may only be um, um, some kind of statistical interruption to a pattern that has caused a lot of concern over years. We all hope it's not. I take the opportunity of congratulating all concerned in that, both those working for New South Wales agencies and also the Commonwealth. One of the dangers of this debate, Mr Speaker, is there for there to be a sense of hopelessness that nothing can be done and that everything that has been tried to date is a failure and is of no use. That is a mistake. There is a wide area of agreement in the community on what ought to be done to tackle the problem. The areas of disagreement on such issues as, as heroin trials and heroin injecting rooms, although they are significant, they mask the fact that in most areas there is enthusiastic cooperation across the political divide between all people concerned in trying to bring about a reduction in drug abuse in the community. I don't think it is a cause that um, any of us should resile from. We should continue the campaign, and there are some signs, Mr Speaker, that in some areas that campaign is beginning to bear fruit. Certain the diversion programs, Mr Speaker, are a good illustration of that, and I thank the premiers of the states of various political complexions for their cooperation in the public interest in tackling this very serious problem. Yeah. Yeah. Member for Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Employment Services. Minister, in question time on Tuesday and again in your previous answer to me, you said breaches are not driven by government policy, they are driven by the behaviour of job seekers. Can the minister, by that logic, explain the 250 per cent increase in job seeker misbehaviour since 1997? And isn't the truth, minister, that the 250 per cent increase in fines levied against the unemployed is explained by your behaviour of demanding a quota of fines on the unemployed for Centrelink to fill? Yeah, yeah. Minister for Employment Services. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, there have been a significant increase in the number of breaches, no doubt about that, and the reason for that is that this government is serious about enforcing the rules. This, this government believes that the social security rules should be upheld. The reason, the reason, the reason for the big increase uh, since the years when Labor was in government is not our harshness, it's your slackness. It was the slackness of the Labor government uh, and, and, the, and the appropriate and the appropriate rigour that this government has put into place, which explains the situation. Honourable Member for Parramatta. Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Could the Treasurer outline to the House the outlook for the current account deficit in 2000-2001, following the release today of the outcomes of the September quarter? by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Treasurer. Mr Speaker, I uh, thank the honourable member for Parramatta for his question. I can inform the uh, House that the September quarter current account figures showed a significant improvement in Australia's current account position, yeah, yeah. registering a deficit of uh, 5.5 billion, Mr Speaker, uh, or only around 3.4 per cent of GDP. 
As I've previously informed the House, uh, the September figures are uh, boosted, of course, by the Olympics. But what they showed is that the volume of exports grew 3.8 per cent in the September quarter. Elaborately transformed manufactured exports rose 5.1 per cent in the quarter, Mr. Speaker. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, and rural commodities exports rose 5.6 per cent in the quarter. Services exports rose 14.4 per cent in the quarter. So this shows a return to strong growth in uh, exports uh, to a round trend following two years below trend coming out of the Asian financial economic crisis. Uh, notwithstanding those uh, strong uh, growth in uh, exports of 3.8 per cent in the September quarter, the volume of imports grew only slightly at 0.4 per cent. As a result of this, Mr Speaker, uh, net exports will contribute 0.7 percentage points to GDP growth in the September quarter when we get it. Today's uh, outcome is a significant improvement in Australia's uh, current account. Uh, the uh, government uh, is forecasting a significant decline in the current account through the year to 4.25 per cent from the 5.4 per cent which was recorded last year. And most importantly, net exports will make a contribution of about one percentage points to Australia's GDP growth. Now, I think, Mr. Speaker, um, we should not get complacent about the uh, current account deficit, and it's something that uh, we must keep a very firm policy handle on. One of the reasons why it's important to run budget surpluses, Mr. Speaker, to build up savings. Can you imagine where Australia would be today if we hadn't have paid off $50 billion of Labor's debt? which Mr Speaker would have just gone on to the debt figures and would have made uh, things that much worse. Mr. Speaker. But the government, uh, of course, uh, can say that since it was elected, it turned away from Labor's wanton fiscal irresponsibility of $10.3 billion deficits and $80 billion rack-ups of debt over five budgets and has made a positive contribution. And I think now that uh, the government was successful in that, uh, people can give it credit. I, uh, I wouldn't normally mention him as, a, as an economic adviser, Mr Speaker, but uh, I was rather taken by the comments uh, on the Graham Richardson show uh, uh, made by, uh, by the man himself, Mr uh, Graham Richardson, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, he referred to yesterday's trade figures, which of course are not in the September quarter. They will go into the December quarter, uh, he said uh, it's very good news. Uh, he was a bit political. I won't read that out. But uh, oh well, he said it was very good news for John Howard. And since you asked me, pretty bad news for Kim Beazley. <laughs> I mean, some mothers do heaven. Oh, he just comes Treasure. in every time. The old member for Hutton. I was going to spare your leader, but since you insisted. Graham, Robertson, Graham Richardson said pretty bad news for Kim Beasley. Member for Dudley. Or maybe he wanted me to read that letter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I tell you, Malcolm Farr's been getting some good telephone Treasurer, calls. We'll come to the question, Mr. Speaker. The old advisers over there uh, who are isolating him from bad news, uh, Mr. Speaker. I suppose uh, Chris from Warramanga is one of those advisors, Mr Speaker. Anyway, to come back to uh, Graham Richardson, you did get that admission out of me that it was bad news for uh, Kim Beasley. This is what Graham Richardson said uh, of Mr Howard. He promised us some sort of economic revival, and looking at the figures, it's happening. You can make your own judgment as to how much to do with it he, how much to do with it he is having, but one thing's for sure. This is the best trade result Australia had in decades, and I mean decades. It's unequivocally good. Graham Richardson, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. And my question is to the Treasurer. Deputy Leader of the Opposition will wait a moment. Member for La Trobe. <laughs> Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to, also to the Treasurer, and it refers to foreign debt the figures of which also came out today. Do you recall promising when you launched the debt truck that cutting the nation's foreign debt would be your first priority? 
Isn't it true that foreign debt today hit a record $294 billion, up 52 per cent since you became the Treasurer? Isn't this $15,480 for every man, woman and child, according to your own preferred measure? And hasn't credit card debt increased 137 per cent over the, the same period? Hasn't argument. household debt increased 69 per cent? And don't Australians now owe more than they earn? Deputy Haven't the you presided over questions. a massive blowout in the debt burden facing Australian families? Treasurer. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I must say uh, it's uh, an element of confusion. He starts off with a question about foreign debt and ends up with credit card debt, Mr. Speaker. He went, uh, he went on to a completely, a completely uh, different subject. I mean, you want to ask a question about foreign debt. You ask a question about foreign debt. You want to ask a question about credit card debt, which is a separate subject. We're happy, we're answer, we're happy to answer that too, Mr. Speaker. But I think it's important, uh, if I come to the question of foreign debt, to um, put some uh, facts on the table. Uh, uh, the first, of course, Mr. Speaker, is that Australia's foreign debt, uh, when the government came to office, was 38.7 per cent of GDP, and is now 46 per cent. In other words, Mr. Speaker, uh, it has stabilised over 40 per cent. But, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition has Speaker, asked his question, and the Treasurer has the call. Some others do have them, so I think we ought to put it into context. When we came to, <laughs> when we came to office, foreign debt was 38.7 per cent of GDP, which, uh, admittedly, Mr. Speaker, is too high. Mr. Speaker, um, in uh, 1983, in 1983. When Labor came to office, foreign debt as a percentage of GDP was 14 per cent. Over those 13 years, the foreign debt as a proportion of GDP went from 14 per cent to 38 per cent. And, Mr Speaker, just to put the number on it, because the member for Melbourne doesn't seem to be able to work out, under the Labor Party, the increase of foreign debt to GDP was 668 per cent. 668 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as, as I said, Mr. Speaker, uh, under the coalition, it increased 24.7 per cent. So 24.7 compared to 668.8 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I said at the time, and I'll say it now, that probably the most irresponsible period of Australian economic management was from 1983 to 1996. Um, not only, of course, was Australia plunged into awful recession, budgets in deficit, a build-up of $80 billion worth of debt, but if you want to look at it in terms of foreign debt as a percentage of GDP, it increased by 668 0.8 per cent, Mr. Speaker. So the good news is that we've arrested the acceleration of increase in foreign debt, which was started by the Australian Labor Party, Mr. Speaker. The second good point the uh, has the is call. that the debt servicing ratio, Mr. Speaker, has fallen and is now at one of its uh, lowest lowest levels ever. The uh, debt servicing ratio. The amount of exports required to pay the interest on net foreign debt is now 9.8 per cent. So the percentage of your exports which you're required to pay in relation to foreign debt is 9.8 per cent, comparing with its peak under the Labor Party of 20 per cent in the September quarter of 1990. And you recall, uh, Mr Speaker, that the Labor Party boasted that it would produce a recession as a consequence of its mismanagement in 1990. But Mr Speaker, the last point I want to make about foreign debt, of course, is that uh, this government can make this claim, which is that it has not added a dollar to foreign debt, because this government has not borrowed a dollar since it came to office. In fact, having paid back $50 billion of Labor Party debt, what we've meant is that whatever it is now, it would have been at least $50 billion at least $50 billion higher had the Labor Party still been in office. 
And, Mr. Speaker, that would be the case, even, even leaving aside the fact that they would still have been running deficit budgets right into 2000, 2001. Mr. Speaker, the Labor Party may not be able to acknowledge it, but as Graham Richardson said, even Graham Richardson, Mr. Speaker, there ideological mentor, the man that taught them all of their tricks, the man, the man that knew even more about electoral matters than the member for Lilly himself, Mr Speaker. Unequivocally good news, he said, the best trade result Australia had in decades, and I mean decades. The honourable member for Macquarie. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Would the Deputy Prime Minister advise the House of the social benefits associated with the federal government's $1.2 billion Roads to Recovery program? Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. And, uh, member for Macmillan. Um, yeah. The, uh, the Prime Minister asked whether I've got time to outline the social benefits, and I haven't really, but I'll make a bit of a go at it and cover some of them. Mr Speaker, I attended the, uh, the first National Road, Local Roads Congress in Moree uh, uh, earlier this year. And that was a landmark event in highlighting the importance of local roads to economies, but not just to economies, uh, but also to, uh, local, uh, in terms of local social uh, benefits. And it brought together some of the best thinkers on road infrastructure in this country. Uh, I should note, of course, that uh, in that uh, 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 circumstance I didn't see the member for Batman there. But, Mr Speaker, the Congress revealed that rural roads support the social fabric of rural communities and regions, and the efficiency of local roads makes a very significant contribution, and I think this is important, to education and health standards in rural communities. And interestingly, Mr Speaker, a survey conducted by the Country Women's Association of Australia, the CWA, in conjunction, in conjunction with the Office of the Status of Women, found that where women were asked their priorities for government spending in rural areas, 69 per cent believed that roads should be the priority. A quite surprising figure, indeed uh, one that would not normally have been expected to have been the case. But the reason given was that improved rural roads were most important to women of all ages, in places of all sizes, whether in remote localities or large country towns, because, as they explained, uh, there is an intrinsic relationship between such things as good roads and a good education. Indeed, the inadequacy of rural roads is a disadvantage to attracting teachers to rural areas. It reduces attendance at schools in some cases quite dramatically. It forces parents to send children to boarding school at an early age, and it forces families to relocate to larger centres in the interest of their children's education. And, Mr Speaker, an Australian Local Government Association survey into the effects on school attendance of Australian children due to poor weather access in wet weather showed that one third, one third of the nation's rural and regional council areas are, are affected. And surprisingly, and I'd have to say of some concern as well, the survey also demonstrated that in around a third of our rural councils, school buses still operate on roads that are closed to heavy traffic during and following wet weather. So, Mr Speaker, there can be no doubt that poor roads contribute to a reduction in educational opportunities at a time when those educational opportunities are more important than ever to all Australian children and particularly those in some of the more remote parts of the country. In the survey, 25 per cent of councils indicated that poor road access had serious implications for the delivery of health services. Councils indicated that, on average, there were five instances each year where it was not possible to get a patient to a hospital by road in the event of an emergency. So, Mr Speaker, these, uh, these points touch on this uh, very real issue of the social benefits provided by rural roads to health, to education, to the normal running of a decent uh, social life and interaction with people in your community. In that circumstance, I have to say that it is just impossible to fathom the Leader of the Opposition's belief—it really is 
that the federal government's $1.2 billion injection into local roads is unnecessary or trivial. Can I remember for Bowman? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Is the minister aware of allegations involving the alleged multiple sexual abuse of a 15-year-old boy, and that's not the 12-year-old boy, inside Woomera, who was so distressed and traumatised by the abuse that he would burn holes into himself? Are you further aware that the boy is claimed to have developed trust in one of the centre's nurses, agreeing to speak about the abuse with centre manager Mr Meekins, on the proviso that she would accompany him? Are you further aware that Mr Meekins prevented the nurse from attending the meeting and effectively stopped the boy's story from being told? Minister, in light of the growing flood of allegations being presented and the obvious reluctance of witnesses to come forward, why won't you establish a full judicial inquiry into the mismanagement of the Woomera Detention Centre? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Mr Speaker, I am aware of the allegation. Um, the allegation was investigated thoroughly by the South Australian Department of Family and Youth Services. Um, they interviewed all of the parties involved, um, undertook a thorough investigation um, and found that uh, no further action was required, no charges to be brought. Um, and uh, um, it seems to me um, that uh, what the member is doing is impugning the professionalism of the authorities who have the capacity to make a judgment in the relation to these matters. The, call. the minister has the call. Minister. Um, the minister has the call. I said yesterday, in relation to uh, the matters that were raised by the honourable member for Bowman, um, that in relation to each and every one of the issues that I assume he will continue to raise, there are appropriate authorities for those matters to be raised with, where thorough and proper and professional investigations can be uh, can be brought. And, and what and, and what and what is particularly relevant in relation to the matter that has now been raised, it is obviously predicated upon advice uh, from the party that he referred to specifically, one of the nurses, um, and nurses have a quite clear legal obligation in relation to what they should do. And uh, no, I'm concerned. I am Member concerned. For I am concerned that people who under state law have a moral and a legal responsibility to report those matters seem to be pressing those buttons now rather than reporting them at a time rather than reporting them at a time when reasonable steps could be taken if they believed the child was at risk to provide that protection member for jagger jagger member for the northern territory For Cowper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Would the Minister advise the House how the New South Wales Mid North Coast will benefit from the $1.2 billion Roads to Recovery program to upgrade the nation's local roads network? Is the Minister aware of enthusiastic support for this program, especially from the electorate of Cowper and the Shires Association of New South Wales? Yeah, yeah. Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. He, of course, is the person who pushed so very hard for the Pacific Highway. I, 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 sort of, I, I seem to recall that the, I seem to recall a three billion dollar program. In fact, it's the biggest, uh, Member for the biggest exercise that uh, governments in this country have been engaged in, in infrastructure since the Snowy Mountain scheme. And I seem to remember that the, the area that you're asking about is the Central Coast, represented in part by the member for Patterson, who wasn't very enthusiastic in his support for the Pacific Highway. He really didn't support it at all. But, Mr Speaker, it's no wonder that in this case people on the mid-north coast have been very keen and very keen to support uh, uh, the, uh, 
to support the package. I mean, Port Stephens around two million dollars, Hastings for over Reed. four million dollars. The member for Reid. You've had the Labor Mayor for Hastings saying uh, that uh, the road funding package will have tremendous economic spin-offs for our region. It will help to boost, he said, economic growth and employment opportunities in the Hastings. Not a bad endorsement, Mr. Speaker. And then the Greater Taree City Council, um, well over four million dollars. The response from the Mayor there, Councillor Mick Tucker. It is absolutely marvellous news for the needs of our local roads network, he said. Adding that uh, council had already set aside an additional $1.6 million in this year's budget for roads and bridges. So he said we've got a major roads program underway. And then there's the Great Lakes uh, Council. They're receiving uh, $2.3 million. Mayor John, Ch John Chadburn was very happy, not only with the funding, but with the fact that the payment will be coming direct from the Commonwealth. He thought that was a very good idea because he had a bit of a concern about the sticky fingers of state governments sort of getting in the way. Uh, I don't think he was referring to Queensland, but he certainly had that concern. And Mr. Speaker, uh, but Mr. Speaker, I have to say that uh, I have another quote in relation to this, and this is my <laughs> this is a favourite of mine, and I'll read it to you. Roads are one of the most important issues in regional Australia today, and in an area like Great Lakes which has a burgeoning population and tourism as a mainstay of its local economy, local economy, the state of roads is not important, not significant, paramount. paramount. And do you know who said that? It was the member for Patterson. It was a member for Patterson. It, was being, it wants more money. He's just confirmed it. He wants more money. More money. Order. Yeah. Now, it was the Minister member for Patterson, the Great Lakes advocate the chair, in September the 20th, the recognising the, the importance of local roads, calling on the federal government to allocate more money. Now, of course, Mr Speaker, that's exactly what we've done. We agree with him. On this one, he's right. You know, they're not just boondoggles. They actually need attention. But unfortunately for the member for Patterson, there's a problem. Member there's for a Patterson. problem. For, <laughs> he digs himself in deeper. He really does. I mean, it, because he's the got a problem. Member for Patterson. I the member for Patterson's Minister, got a problem. Minister and that is quite clearly that the Leader the of the chair. Opposition says these works are trivial and unnecessary. So the member for Patterson saying local roads are, more, are important in order to get more funding, he, he gets more, it from the Commonwealth trivia. Government, but his own leader won't acknowledge that they're important. He still regards them as unnecessary. And uh, for that matter, the member for Batman doesn't have much impact either. He was actually with the member for Patterson when the member, pa member for Patterson said we ought to be spending more money because it's paramount importance. He was with him, but it obviously hasn't yet registered that this is an important issue with the leader for the opposition. Because I want to uh, quote something he said uh, the other day as well. Because uh, Ian Mickle, the president of the Western Australian Municipal Association, he was a call at a Radio State 6 PR back on Tuesday, and he called to welcome the federal government's $1.2 billion roads to recovery local road funding package, but he wasn't too impressed with the chief boondoggle opposite. He had this to say. Uh, here in Esperance, we've been arguing for more road funding from the feds for a long, long time. And he went on to say, it was rather interesting, and I'm particularly concerned, we haven't been able to tie in the federal opposition to this issue. Uh, because with a four-year program and just a year to go to a federal election, it is absolutely essential that we get a clear commitment from the Labor Party that this program will be ongoing. Otherwise, it's not worth much to us at all. And Mr Beasley, when he was in Esperance last week, I tackled him on this and wait for it. And three times I brought him back to the question of the commitment of his party if they were elected to the government committing to these rural roads funds. And he didn't. He didn't. He just kept he just talked well he does do a lot of talking. He just talked away from the subject. Didn't give me a response at all. And I know he's still making statements about fuel prices. He's not talking about road funding at all. I think road funding is absolutely essential to us in Esperance. Esperance happens, of course, to be in the Leader of the Opposition's home state. So, Mr Speaker, three times uh, I've been there, several times. Now, Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition was asked to commit his party to supporting this package three times, and three times he turned down the opportunity. He refused to commit himself. I wonder just how the member for Patterson feels about that. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. 
Prime Minister, do you stand by your claim that you never promised the price of ordinary beer, draft beer, would increase by only 1.9 per cent as a result of the GST? Are you aware that 850,000 Australians have signed a petition circulating in Australia's hotels and clubs saying you did make that promise and that you broke it? Are you aware that this is the biggest petition ever presented to Parliament? And Prime Minister, why won't you keep your promise on ordinary beer? Prime Minister, this matter has been the subject of numerous questions in the past, and I have no reason to resile from anything I've said in answer to questions in the past. Uh, of course, people um, uh, offered the opportunity to sign a petition for cheaper beer would do so. I mean, that's a perfectly, Deputy of the opposition has thoroughly asked characteristically question. Australian thing to do, Mr. Speaker. I'd be perfectly Deputy astonished Leader if they had signed the petition. Has asked his question. Member for Kuyong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Education, Training and Youth Affairs. Would the Minister inform the House about support from parents' organisations for the government's schools funding legislation? How do these views contrast with alternative strategies? Minister for Education, Training and Youth Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for Kuyong for his question. Parents are speaking out now, Mr. Speaker, loudly and clearly about their support for the government's $22 billion school funding package. Unfortunately, the Leader of the Opposition doesn't want to listen to these parents. The New South Wales Parents' Council, representing over 332,000 children attending non-government schools in New South Wales, have written, I believe, a letter to all members in which they say, and I quote, we urge you to support the immediate passage of the bill without amendment. And the Parents' Council goes on to say, the funding mechanism established by the legislation has been three years in development. ALP opposition and Democrat members and senators showed little interest in the scheme during that period. And parents are now extremely concerned that the progress of the debate on this legislation puts the Commonwealth funding for school education, both government and non-government, at risk for 2001. And, Mr Speaker, the South Australian Independent Schools Board says, and I quote, the winners will be parents and families now able to better choose the education that best suits their children. And they go on to point out the regional dividend. 30 South Australian regional and rural schools from Seduna to Mount Gambia will benefit. Mr Speaker, parents and parents' organisations are being treated with contempt, contempt by the Labor Party and the Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition is playing games with the lives of families and preventing schools planning properly for next year. And every day that he delays signals his contempt for Australian parents. Uh, in a famous example of Beasley speak, which is becoming very popular on the back bench of the Labor Party, Mr. Speaker, he says he doesn't, he doesn't want to shoot the hostages, but he certainly doesn't mind roughing up the hostages a little bit. He doesn't mind making life difficult for them. As I've said in the House on many occasions, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition has form, has form in this area. His strategy, his strategy at the last election, which we remember, engineered by uh, Pizzullo and, and Ang Lee, as the team was then, cost him his shadow minister, who now sits up there like a vulture on the back bench, uh, hanging, up, hanging around, just waiting to see what happens. And, and we, we, we remember what he said at the last uh, election campaign about the Labor Party and Mr. Kim Beasley's education policy. And this is what the member for Werriwa said, Mike Pizzullo, chief policy adviser and John Angley, who wrote, worked for Kim as finance minister and had no involvement in the education area, rewrote the bloody thing. That was the member for Werriwa's term. So they stuffed it up. And the same advisers have done it again with schools policy again. The, 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 the Daily Telegraph summed it up very well this morning, Mr Speaker. It said, save the hostages, Kim, and shoot the brains trust. Now, the, 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 the Leader of the Opposition should stop treating Australian parents with contempt and get on and pass the bill. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Paterson. The Member for Paterson has the call. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question without notice is to the Prime Minister. 
Have you seen this email circulated to all MPs in all parties describing a petition circulated in the Murray electorate, quote, protesting against the excessive fuel tax and describing the support of local member Dr Sharman Stone? And I quote, Dr Stone indicated to us the great value she placed upon these petitions in supporting her challenge to the Prime Minister and, and Treasurer for a reduction in the, the price of fuel. The will come to his question. Oh, I am, Mr Speaker. Dr Stone stated she was a regular contact with the Treasurer Member for regarding will this come issue. To his question. Prime Minister, if your own backbench is trying to save their skins by campaigning against your petrol tax in their electorates, why should struggling Australian motorists believe your promises? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it, um, I get a lot of emails and I see a lot of material pass across my desk. I've I got to say I haven't seen that one, Mr. Speaker. I haven't seen that one, but uh, let, me, let me simply say that. Um, uh, let, let me, let Prime me Minister say has to the, the call. Uh, to the Honourable Member for Patterson that. Um, the when, um, Member for Dobell, uh, the Prime when, Minister uh, has the, the call. When Member the, for Dobell. When the government's um, uh, an announcement uh, in relation to road funding was, uh, was briefed or was foreshadowed to the joint party rooms uh, earlier this week, Mr Speaker, I can, I can assure you that um, the reaction was um, um, little short of, um, uh, how shall we put it, rapturous in terms of, uh, a little short of rapturous, Mr Speaker, in terms of um, in terms of the, um, the, the welcome, the welcome that's been extended by all of my colleagues to something that people in, in rural, regional Australia and the cities, I mean, the, the take out this week of the road funding announcement, Mr Speaker, is the complete fool the opposition leader's made of himself on the subject. He, he, he has, I mean, his great line, Mr Speaker, his great line was, was that this was going to be totally skewed towards rural electorates. As soon as we talked about road funding, without any sort of thought as to how the government might do it, he raced in immediately, Mr Speaker, and he said, oh, this is going to be entirely for National Party electorate. It's going to be entirely for rural electorate. The reality, Mr Speaker, is that this money is being distributed in accordance with a Labor Party formula, Mr Speaker. It is being distributed in accordance with the formula established by state grants commissions in the early 1990s when the Keating government was in office here in Canberra, Mr Speaker. So once the state gets the money, it is then distributed, not in accordance with who holds the electorate, but in accordance, Mr Speaker, with a formula worked out, a formula worked out by State Grants Commission. And that has left uh, the, the Leader of the Opposition, who regards road funding as trivial and unnecessary, that has left the Leader of the Opposition in an absolutely ridiculous position. There is not a member opposite who does not want this road funding for their electorate, Mr Speaker. There is isn't a council anywhere in Australia who is not grateful to this federal government. We are providing a 75 per cent increase, Mr Speaker. We are providing a 75 per cent increase. And might I, might I observe, Mr Speaker, that next week— Member for Patterson. Next week, Mr Speaker, there will be the, uh, the annual meeting of the Local Government Association of Australia, Mr Speaker, here in Canberra. And uh, not surprisingly, Mr Speaker, I have received an invitation to address that gathering, Mr Speaker, and not surprisingly, I have accepted the invitation, Mr Speaker, and I will have something to say at that gathering about this government's record on road funding, a record of which we are immensely proud. Mem Member for Patterson. Uh, Mr Speaker, I seek leave to table the email that uh, the Prime Minister has not yet but opened is and read. The, is leave granted? Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for Deakin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and Small Business. Would the Minister outline what the federal government is doing to help workers who have lost their jobs because of their employer's insolvency, leaving some of their entitlements unpaid. Is the minister aware of any alternative proposals in this area? The Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and Small Business, Leader of the House. Uh, I thank the member for Deakin uh, for his uh, question, Mr Speaker. It is timely, as uh, the House uh, 
uh, draws to a close for this year, just to look back on the introduction uh, of a significant extension of the safety net for the benefit of Australian workers. And I thank uh, the member for his question because uh, he and members on our side of the House have been strong supporters of putting in place a scheme to ensure that when workers were find themselves out of a job and without their entitlements, people on this side of the House were prepared to support a scheme that gave them assistance in their hour of need. And Mr Speaker, of course, we also amended the corporations law uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to deal with people who have been in breach of the corporations law. But in terms of practical help, the fact is that when you lose your job and you don't get your entitlements, rather than to have to wait uh, on the uh, possible chance of some recovery two or three years down the track, it is very important, Mr Speaker, that uh, as quick as it can be achieved, that support is provided to workers in that situation. And, Mr Speaker, uh, I'm pleased to say to the House that uh, uh, we have, uh, since the introduction of the scheme uh, in respect of insolvency starting on 1 January this year, uh, 1,125 employees have been helped. And they've been helped in uh, the circumstances of 70 insolvencies. And, Mr. Speaker, in uh, the most recent case, for example, uh, which was uh, Victoria Knitting Mills Proprietary Limited uh, in uh, New South Wales, 19 employees were helped, uh, with uh, $70,000 uh, to go towards uh, their entitlements. Mr. Speaker, if the New South Wales State Labor government had supported those employees and likewise matched us on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis, those employees would be getting nearly 80 per cent of their entitlements. That is real assistance uh, when people need it. Mr Speaker, the, uh, I'm asked are there any alternative policies. The fact is that the Labor Party has not only opposed this policy, they have opposed supporting workers in their hour of need, and furthermore, they have used uh, what little political influence they have to encourage the state governments not to support it because it was a coalition idea. You know, this is a, for, the, for the basest possible political motives. You have turned your backs against workers in their hour of need. And, Mr Speaker, I'm asked, are there any alternative Member policies? Dixon. There is no alternative policy. No alternative policy. Uh, the, po the, the things that you've said, to the extent that they're coherent, would cost a packet, have no international precedent. Leader would, of the opposition. Would impose costs on good businesses to Leader pay for of bad the opposition. The minister has and, the call. And even the ACTU, Mr. Speaker, uh, has instead called on the Labor Party to support the scheme that is in operation. It is the only national scheme, uh, Mr. Speaker. As we go to Christmas, it is a national disgrace that the Labor Party turn their backs on workers when they need a bit of help. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, I conclude by saying also. Uh, this scheme has not happened by chance. It, of course, has happened uh, because for 13 years, when the Labor Party was in office, they never lifted a finger to help workers in this situation. And it took a Howard-led government to ensure workers were helped. And I conclude by also noting, Mr. Speaker, uh, I do want to pay uh, a tribute uh, to the people within my own department who have worked very hard to make this scheme a reality and who I know are dedicated. Uh, to ensuring that we help workers when they need. It's about time the Labor Party stood up and had to counter themselves when it comes to helping workers. Member for Batman. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. My question without notice is to, Mr. Speaker, my question without notice is addressed to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Minister, isn't it a fact that a briefing last night by your office and department to my staff, it was confirmed that the formula for allocating road funding to recovery between states is not the same as the current formula? Minister, given that you claim your road funding package is not biased towards coalition seats, why do you refuse to publicly disclose the new formula for the allocation of road funding? Good question. The minute, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, the member for Batman has asked a question. As far as I know, the question was not asked of the member for Melbourne. And for that reason, I'm recognising the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Transport and Regional Services. 
Mr Speaker, uh, I think the honourable member for his question has been railing on about it in this place and trying to sort of make a mountain out of a molehill. Look, uh, as the Prime Minister has made quite plain in terms of um, in terms of allocations between councils within each state, let me come to that aspect of it first. Within each state, they are strictly in accordance with the formula adopted by the state's grants commission. All right, uh, the state grants commissions established and applied under the previous government. And for that reason, as I said earlier, and as I said in my speech earlier in introducing this. Uh, a very landmark reform and initiative that any claims to suggest that allocations to councils have been manipulated to favour the electorates of government members are completely scurrilous. They're the same as the outcomes would have been under your formula. It is your formula. It is your approach. And the only other comment I've got to make, Mr Speaker, is that in relation to the historical methodology for allocating road funding, local road funding between state and territories. Uh, there, is, uh, there was uh, an Minister. approach. Is this this is the answer. Deputy Prime Minister, resume his seat. Member for Batman. Mr Deputy Speaker, the question went to between states, not between councils in a given state. The, the, Batman, the member for Batman is aware that uh, the obligation that the chair has is to ensure that the answer is relevant to the question and the answer is entirely relevant. Minister, and this is the member who was in here casting dispersions on my Minister educational will, background this question. morning. Uh, just coming to it, just coming to it. You know, look, they're obviously deputy not leader interested of the in opposition the opposition and the member for Melbourne, the deputy prime minister, the minister for transport and regional services, has the call. The historical methodology for allocating between states and territories threw up a couple of not major but significant anomalies that we felt needed to be acknowledged. The key one, to my way of thinking, was that even on the most superficial glance, South Australia was being done in the eye in terms of what we thought were important, population and road distances. Now, um, you know, in terms of the claim that the member for Batman has been running around this place, I just make the observation, so far as I know, there are no members uh, uh, of my party in South Australia. I'll just make that on the way through in terms of what he's been saying. That's dead but, right. uh, <laughs> But, They're all good but I do just make the point <laughs> that in recognition <laughs> yeah, we'll have a go at it if you like. We'll, we'll, we'll see if we can do something about it. No, no, no. <laughs> but, I think it would be appropriate, speaker, it would be appropriate speaker, at this stage sense. for at least the speaker to interject and say that it would be helpful if the minister were to come to the question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, we look, but the allocation is based on historical precedence, in other words, uh, the long-term approach that's been adopted, but which uh, the, member, the minister responsible for local government uh, has been uh, uh, indicating some concerns in relation to particularly South Australia, but historical precedence and the entirely legitimate form of considerations of the length of local roads and population. I just think it is scurrilous and absolutely without foundation. But perhaps most significantly, without credibility, to claim that this package is uh, a pork barrel any more than that it is, uh, it is uh, you know, a boondoggle. But, uh, Mr Speaker, you know, I think there's no doubt about it. It takes one to know one. Now, the local governments to whom this is directed, of course, have instantly recognised this is a very valuable program and one that they want. When it comes to knowing uh, the ALP's capacity to look after people uh, wherever they live in Australia, it certainly takes one to know one. And uh, since I'm talking about South Australia, down there they have a thing called the Country Labor Association. South Australians presumably know about it. Oh, well, that's a pity because uh, uh, their highly regarded uh, uh, chief, Bill Hender, Bill Hender, has just resigned. And he resigned because he said of the ALP, the machine does not like policies which have competent practical solutions. <laughs> He went on to say, when I resigned as president of the Country Labor Association, they had every opportunity to ask me why, but not one of them bothered. Country representatives know why. He went on to say, that, and I'm just quoting in part, uh, well, it takes one to know one. Uh, People who think they can get a better deal for Labor, he said, are in for a shock. And he went on, he claimed that Labor, he said, uh, was full of city centrics, but he corrected himself. No, he said, not even that. They're so full the of their own self-interest, the I don't think they're interested in the city either. Oh. 
Honourable Member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Would the Minister advise what the government is doing to minimise and ultimately eliminate private health insurance medical gaps? Would the Minister also inform the House of any alternative policies to assist Australians who have private health insurance? Minister for Health and Aged Care. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. When we came to government, there were no gap cover schemes available or operating in Australia. And the gap, along with price, is one of the two biggest disincentives people have to private health insurance. We've been able to address price with the 30 per cent rebate and having two years where health fund premium increases have been very low. But I've just received some very good news from the Private Health Insurance Administrative Council. We've never before kept figures on gaps. I have asked FIAC to do so, and they've given me their first report. And in the September quarter, nearly two million medical services were provided in hospital at no gap whatsoever. Mm -hmm. That 60 per cent of all in-hospital services around Australia were on a no-gap basis in the September quarter. About 12 months ago, the best estimate we can have is less than 10 per cent of in-hospital services were in no-gap. In the June quarter, around 50 per cent. So this number is going up exponentially. In Victoria, Western Australia and South Australia, 70 per cent of in-hospital services are on a no-gap basis. No state has less than half its hospital services on a no-gap basis. Queensland and South Australia doubled the amount of no-gap services in just one quarter. Sorry, Queensland and Tasmania doubled in uh, just one quarter. We estimate that uh, it will plateau at about 70 per cent of services on a no-gap basis before the recent changes to gap cover schemes that passed through the parliament in August come into place. Those uh, will start to show in the March and June quarters next year, and we believe that we can uh, approach 80 per cent of all hospital services in Australia with no gaps whatsoever. The good news, Mr Speaker, is this has come at no cost to premiums. 70 per cent, sorry, funds representing 70 per cent of all members in Australia have already advised me they will not be applying for premium increases next year. That is, they will be at least zero for 70 per cent of members covered. And I hope the final number will be much closer to 100 per cent. So this new gap cover scheme that provides 60 per cent coverage across Australia as of uh, last quarter is at no increased premiums whatsoever. The Honourable Member asked me if there were any alternate policies to uh, assist Australians who have private health insurance. We, of course, are still waiting for this, Mr Speaker. We have had 31 press releases against the uh, 30 per cent rebate from the opposition, not one in favour. We are happy to be judged by a record. The Honourable Member for Batman. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Minister, I refer to the road funding formula you use under the Roads to Recovery program. Minister, can you explain to the people of Tasmania why Tasmania receives only 3.3 per cent of the allocation under Roads to Recovery, whereas they receive 5.5 per cent under identified Member, local road grants? Not ask the question. Minister for Forest and Conservation was not asked for an opinion. Member for Shortland. Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Because, Mr Speaker, we took proper account of road distance, population, historical factors, and, and, uh, and, uh, and Mr Speaker, uh, uh, we'll also be explaining Member to the good Grandler. people of Tasmania that it was we who delivered it, while the Leader of the Opposition doesn't believe they should get anything more for their local roads. Member for Wannan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Employment Services. And I ask the Minister, is he aware of recent conflicting public statements concerning the work for the Dole program? What is the government's response to these statements? Minister for Employment Services. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Wannan for his question. I note that unemployment in his area has fallen from 14.1 per cent 
when the uh, member for Hotham was the relevant minister. Uh, it's now 7.5 per cent, which is obviously far too high, but it's a lot better than it was in the bad old days uh, of the Labor Deputy Party's Leader government. The opposition. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, on Monday, uh, the member for Dixon said, uh, and, uh, and I quote, Labor has stated it will not abolish work for the dull. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, Labor's said it, but it hasn't meant it. It said it, but it hasn't meant it. Uh, in February, the member for Dixon said, and I quote, there are a lot of things, like work for the dull, which actually could be reformed to make sure that they provide proper training. In May, she said, uh, we do support some equivalent of the work for the dull scheme, but the current system is severely flawed. In June, she said, probably we would change the name. And Mr Speaker, on Tuesday of this week, a day after saying that she would keep the program, she says, and I quote, if the same money had been spent on training and proper work placement programs, Many millions could have been saved. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the member for Dixon, she member wants to Dixon. change the structure of the program. She wants to change the name of the program, and she wants to redirect the funding elsewhere. In other words, she wants to abolish the program. It's a different name. It's a different structure, and there's no funding for it. So, it will not exist. It will not exist under Member Labor. Now, Mr. Member, Speaker, uh, Manager of Mr. Speaker, if, uh, if, I've, has if I've got things wrong, Mr. Speaker, if yeah. I've misunderstood uh, that much wronged, the much wronged member for Dixon, if I've misunderstood her, perhaps, Mr. Speaker, perhaps, Mr. Speaker, she could call a press conference this afternoon, a full press conference, and clear things up. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. Prime, Deputy Prime Minister, are you aware that, the, that your media documentation allocates full road funding for the City of Brisbane, $29 million as new funding for the seat of Oxley? Oh, Minister, is this the same $29 million that your media documentation claims as new funding for the seat of Ryan? Minister, is this the same $29 million that your media documentation claims is the new funding for the seat of Brisbane? <laughs> Minister, is this the same $29 million that your media documentation claims as new funding for each of 11 Brisbane seats? <laughs> Minister, why are you misleading the people of Bowman, Brisbane, Dixon, Fadden, Griffith, Lilly, Morton, Oxley, Petrie, Rankin and Ryan by telling them they are all getting the same $29 million? <laughs> When the House has come to order, Minister, Minister for Primary Industry, Member for Hindmarsh, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Mr Speaker, we have not misrepresented the size of the package. It's a $1.2 billion package, which you won't commit yourselves to, and to which, and to which we note to this point in time not one of you has actually joined us in insisting that your friends in the state governments of places like Tasmania actually match what we're doing for them. Now, Mr Speaker, we have listed, we have documented <laughs> not relevant. The, the, how can that, Mr Speaker, how can that the, possibly the, be not relevant? Deputy Prime Minister will resume his seat. Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Leader of the Opposition Relevance, has a point Mr. of order. Speaker, yes. Relevance. He's been asked a question as to why his government has allocated the same twenty nine million in its propaganda to every one the of the Brisbane seats. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. And he will not address it. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. I noted the question. The the Deputy Prime Minister had been on his feet for a matter of 20 seconds. He had been talking about the question of road funding, and that was relevant to the question asked. I call the Deputy Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, there is no trickery in this at all. The fact is, the fact is that we have listed every local government area in the country. Uh, many of them do indeed overlap federal uh, electric boundaries. Well, what is Member so amazing for about that? I mean, surely, you know, everyone knows that they have local government areas. That the Member for Charlton. 
Now, we have not, unlike you, unlike and unlike what some of the state ministers have suggested we do, we haven't got into the business of, of telling local governments where they will spend that money, that it must be allocated within the boundaries of such and such a federal electorate. We haven't gone down that road. But now, Mr Speaker, quite simply, every member, including those opposite, has a list. I haven't noticed any of them sending it back. None of them want to sort of deny the money. Have a simple list pointing to the councils the for member which, for which Charlton. fall within their electorates, or in the case of councils which uh, overlap with other electorates, pointing to the, the sums of money that each of those councils will receive direct from the Commonwealth Government. And uh, I would have thought that was perfectly easy to disaggregate, perfectly easy for responsible members everywhere to accurately reflect in this very widely and very well received uh, program. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the course, opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it remains the fact that the ALP leader has refused to endorse the package, to commit himself to it. He still believes this is a boondoggle and unnecessary. And in addition to that, they have done nothing to join us in what I would have thought would have been a spirit of, uh, of, of common sense, of a commitment to economic and social reform, and calling on the state governments to match what we are doing. Yeah, yeah. Member for Menzies. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Financial Services and Regulation. Would the Minister advise the House of the consequences of the failure of the states to agree to referring corporations' law responsibility to the Commonwealth? What effect will this have on the progress of the government's corporate law reform program? And thirdly, what are the consequences for business confidence? The Minister for Financial Services and Regulation. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for Menzies, who uh, certainly, as a very competent lawyer, uh, had a, would have a keen interest in this matter. Um, <coughs> Mr. Speaker. When it comes to the corporations law, the Commonwealth has the same objectives today as it did when an agreement was made with the states in 1990. We want Australia's one million companies to have one rule of law, whether they be in Bendigo or Bathurst. We want Australia's millions of company employees to have the same protection under company law, whether they are based in Fremantle or Fairfield. We want Australian industries like building and construction, transport and storage, tourism and health to have the same single law apply for companies across Australia. And when it comes to Australia's seven million shareholders, we want them to have the same information in the same prospectus with the same investment returns, whether they live in Launceston or Fitzroy Crossing. And Mr Speaker, we ask why are the states determined to now put in place a new corporations law scheme that could end up with six different laws applying across Australia? Why are they prepared to do it? Mr Speaker, the states with their current proposal want the ability to cherry pick any new corporate law scheme to suit their individual purposes. And Mr Speaker, at a time when trillions of investment dollars move into companies around the world each day, we have Premier Beattie wanting the 90,000 companies in Queensland to face investment uncertainty as a result of some political stunts. In Victoria, where the member for Menzies is based, Premier Brax wants 174,000 companies there to worry more about political stunts on industrial relations than to worry about the certainty of incorporation or the cost of issuing different prospectuses with different laws right around Australia. Mr Speaker, the Commonwealth has bent over backwards to try and accommodate the states and their concerns in relation to the referral of powers. We have put in place every practical, workable safeguard they have needed to protect the intention of the referral. We have gone further in the corporations agreement to protect the state's rights than ever before, and the time has come for common sense to prevail. We stand ready, the Commonwealth stands ready,
to continue to negotiate with the states in good faith. But ultimately, if the states are not willing to trade, then we are left with no option but to implement our own laws based on our own powers. Mr Speaker, 100 years ago, the states couldn't agree on a railway gauge across Australia. Today, the corporation's law is as significant. It is vital that we have one system for one nation. Here, here. The Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. Deputy Prime Minister, do you recall denying that your road package favours government members? Minister, can you confirm that there are 17 seats that receive funding of $25 million or more? Minister, is it not the case that every one of those 17 seats is held by the government? Is it also not a fact that the Northern Territory is bigger than all but one Member of them for and Capricornia bigger than most of them? Member for Minister, Herbert. how can you stand by your statement that this package does not favour coalition seats? Oh, yeah. oh. Member for Eden Monero. Member for Boothby. When the House has come to order. Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Mr Speaker, um, the fact is, as I said, the distribution uh, within the states is based on the State Grants Commission's formula. Who, who was it that operated that exactly as it is now for decades? They did. The, the ALP. The, ALP the Leader did. of the Opposition has asked his Mr. question. Speaker. The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Now, Mr Speaker, there's no unfairness in this. As I've quite clearly indicated, uh, both our approach and that of the State Grants uh, Commission plainly seek to weight appropriately population and rate base. Now, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that, of course, those opposite don't hold a lot of the, large, the larger seats in this country where you have a small population base. Uh, and very large areas and long road distances, you don't hold much of that country across the nation. I, mean, I don't think it's very hard to find the reasons why. I mean, our good old friend Bill member Henderson the Northern, sort of identified the member them pretty for the well. Territory. Deputy Prime Minister, the member for McEwen. Leader of the Opposition. Take a point of order on relevance, Mr Speaker. Oh. He is clearly moving away from answering this specific question. The Northern Territory has a larger the population of the than any other seat. seat and the, the Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat by any measure. The Deputy Prime Minister was being relevant to the question asked. Deputy Prime Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I really didn't have much to add, except that you know it is very obvious that the leader of the opposition has still not got the message that local roads in this country need attention. There are economic and social reasons for giving them attention. Uh, the member for Paterson understands that, but he hasn't been able to convince his leader. Now, we don't know whether he's not been able to convince Martin Ferguson, the member for Batman, of the case or whether the fact is that he has been able to convince the member for Batman that he hasn't been able to convince the Leader of the Opposition. Deputy well, Prime but, Minister, but, but, but the fact Deputy remains Prime that, Minister, that our good no old mate— Deputy Prime Minister, for Arts and Centenary of Federation. Our good old mate, Bill Hender, uh, you know, I mean, he really had the nail on this one as well when he said, I'm getting awfully sick of the self-named Labor machine. It's shooting the messenger Deputy rather Prime than Minister accepting the message. To come to the question. Has the Deputy Prime Minister concluded his answer? Member for Page. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, representing the Minister for the Environment. Would the Minister outline to the House the benefits of the government's alternative energy bill, a renewable energy bill? bill sorry. Is the Minister aware of proposals to build co-generation electricity plants 
in rural towns like Condong on the north coast of New South Wales? What are the implications for jobs, small businesses and the environment in regional towns if the bill is not passed? The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question because it draws attention to the government's very important renewable energy bill, but I'm sorry to say that Labor and Democrat senators are seeking to block this important legislation, which has the potential to create between five and 10,000 jobs, many of them in regional Australia, and to result in investments of two to three billion dollars in renewable energy plants. Now, these, these plants will particularly benefit regional communities because that's where the jobs will be created. A lot of them will be dependent, and one in the northern rivers of New South Wales, one in my own electorate, uh, will use largely uh, sugarcane for gas, but obviously uh, that is not available 12 months of the year because uh, of, of seasonal factors, and so they need to get some alternative feedstock. And, uh, in many instances, that alternative feedstock will need to be sawmill waste or some other residue. Now, it seems it's this unwillingness for sawmill waste to be used in these renewable energy plants that's causing a problem for Labor and the Democrats. They would prefer to see this waste burnt or, or lost altogether than to be used in any kind of a constructive way. Now, it would be a tragedy if this important legislation this pro-environment legislation, this legislation that's about uh, recycling and renewable energy, was to be blocked by Labor and the Democrats. And, there's been, and there are a lot of concern in communities like my own in the Northern Rivers that uh, this particular pr this proposal uh, could be lost. In fact, there was a delegation uh, from the sugar industry uh, in the parliament uh, a few days ago. In my own electorate, in a couple of days, more than 2,000 signatures were collected demanding that Labor and Democrats support this, support this legislation, and, uh, and, and I certainly join, that, uh, join those calls. But I'm not the only one who thinks it should be passed, and I'm sure the Honourable Member Page would also be interested to know that in the Mirabra newspaper yesterday, listen Canberra, we want the plant, the Labor candidate for Mirabra is, is quoted demanding that uh, Labor and Democrat senators not put the cogeneration plant and local jobs in, in, in jeopardy when voting next on the renewable energy mm -hmm. bill. So many people in the Labor Party want this passed as well. And I asked the member for Patterson what's his approach to this issue because one of these plants, is, as he pointed out earlier, is proposed for his electorate as well. Is he prepared to sacrifice those regional jobs over some silly deal about green preferences. Now we've heard a fair bit about Labor Party's preferences deals lately. This is a deal about green preferences that's prepared to sacrifice country jobs. They should get onto it, pass this bill, and allow this, this tremendous investment to proceed in regional Australia. Mr. Speaker, I ask Prime a further Minister. question to be placed in the notice paper. Treasurer. Mr. Speaker, I seek leave to add to an answer. Treasurer may proceed. Mr Speaker, um, in percentage terms, the growth in uh, net foreign debt between March 83 and March 1996 was 668%, and from March 1996 to September 2000, 52%. As a proportion of GDP, the growth between March 83 and March 1996 was 176% and between March 96 to September 2020 per cent. Mr Speaker, uh, in relation to the current account, I should uh, inform to the House that as a percentage of GDP, for the first time in nearly 30 years, Australia now has a smaller current account deficit than the United States here, here. in percentage terms. Mr Speaker, uh, this is a point which has been made uh, in the uh, BT uh, uh, report, which has been put out today by Chris Caton, who, after making the observation that for Member for the Melbourne. first time in uh, 30 years, Australia's current account— Member for Melbourne is warm. For, uh, Chris Caton, who pointed out for the first time in nigh on 30 years as a percentage of GDP, Australia's current account is smaller than the, that of the United States also went on to say this. This is Chris Caton, Mr Speaker. I just want to add this to my answer. An ex-Prime Minister told me 
that the trade accounts will work further towards balance over the next year. That's what Mr Caton put uh, in his uh, report today, and I'm happy to make that available, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Member for Indi. Oh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I seek leave to uh, make a personal explanation on the Does grounds that I— Member for Indi claim to have been misrepresented? I, I do, sir. Member sir, in an I may proceed. Thank you, sir. In an article in The Age today headed, Road Fund Claims Are Dishonest, ALP, references made to me and my electorate and some other members, and the announcements made by me and others on the uh, $1.2 billion Roads to Recovery program. Uh, I believe that the article uh, uh, provides an inference that uh, uh, the statements made by me as local member for Indi were inaccurate and didn't correctly state the amounts uh, granted. In fact, the art, my news release carefully stated the amounts granted. It was $23 million. Member for Indi has Victoria. indicated where he was misrepresented. Yes, sir. And uh, mm. the, the uh, article does go on and say that some members were careful to correctly state it, and by inference and omission, omitting my name there, they therefore Member for misrepresented Indi has indicated my position. Where he was misrepresented. Member for Murray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to make a personal explanation. Is the member for Murray claimed to be misrepresented? Most grievously. The member Mr. for Speaker. Murray may proceed. Mr. Speaker, in question time today, the member for Patterson referred to an email he received from three people from the electorate of Murray. The member claimed this email was evidence of my not supporting our government's response to fuel prices. Mr. Speaker, what the member failed to mention was that the email included a petition directed against me precisely because I am very actively and publicly supporting and explaining this government's policy. In Member, fact, Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Member for Murray has the I'm call. well and truly on the public record. In fact, my, all my local media will illustrate that Member point. for Murray has indicated where she has been misrepresented. Thank you. Member for McEwen. Uh, Mr Speaker, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. The member for McEwen claimed to have been misrepresented. I do indeed, uh, Mr Speaker. Today, in the, uh, in the same article that the member for Indi referred to, the article by Annabel Crabb, I have been misrepresented on two counts, one in relation to the, the inference about the 26 million road funding that uh, uh, was made available across the shires in my electorate. I went to great detail, Mr Speaker, to say that my electorate had access to that funding. It is also indicated that I have ten— The member for McEwen has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I will— Thank you, Mr Speaker. It has also, in this article, indicated that I have ten councils. In fact, I have eight, and I can tell you that all eight think that this funding package the is fantastic. The member for McEwen has indicated where she has been misrepresented. The member for Burke is only being denied the call by the antics of some on my left. Member for Hunter might confer on the other side of that aisle. Member for Burke. Mr Speaker, yesterday uh, after question time I took a point of order and in the, uh, in the discussions that ensued when you were faced with a number of points of order you didn't actually rule on the, or, or comment on the point of order I raised with you. It's in relation to Standing Order 78 which states that when the attention of the Speaker is drawn to words used, he or she shall determine whether or not they are offensive or disorderly. I pointed out yesterday that in my experience in the House, whenever a member had uh, asked the Speaker to take action because the member found a particular term offensive, it had been my long-standing experience that the Speaker always required the offender to withdraw as a courtesy to the member. The events that have taken place today give me to wonder whether or not you have actually now moved in your interpretation of that practice by the Speaker, and that's the question that I'm asking you. When I responded yesterday, I, um, from memory I was responding to both members for Newcastle and Burke, but if I didn't respond accurately to the member for Burke's, 
inquiry, I'm happy to indicate to him that there has been no change in my attitude or approach. If I consider, a, obviously, if I consider a term is by precedent unparliamentary, then there seems to be a sort of instant judgment from the member for Lyons, so that no matter whether one has completed a statement or not, he is determined whether guilty or innocent, regardless of the completion of the statement. So that if a term is unparliamentary, clearly there is an obligation on anyone who uses that term to withdraw it. If a term causes offence, it's up, for the, up to the occupier of the chair to determine whether or not it's appropriate that that, chair, that term should be withdrawn, depending on the nature of the term. That is not a new rule. You'll find that my predecessors made similar rulings, and I'm happy to check the rulings and come back to the member for Burke. But to answer his question as briefly as I can, obviously I'll require all unparliamentary terms to be withdrawn, and as is often the case during my stewardship of this chair, I've asked members who have used terms that are not unparliamentary but that I've been deemed to be undesirable to simply exercise a little more uh, restraint. Member for, member for Burke. Can I make a, uh, a further request of you in respect of that, and I appreciate the fact that you're going to come back to me on it, just to, uh, I guess, refine what it is I'm, I'm specifically asking. The, the practice in the past, and, and as, has, as happened in this situation yesterday, uh, as you explained and everybody accepted, the, uh, you actually misinterpreted the comments that were made and therefore weren't in a position at that point to determine whether they were offensive or not. The situation that occurred was that the member, in this case uh, the member for Dixon, was offended and drew your attention to the fact that she was offended and asked for the words to be withdrawn. It's been my experience that in that situation the Speaker has always asked the offender to do that. And that's what I'm specifically asking. Are you now moving away from that common practice that in a situation like that the Speaker generally insists that the words be withdrawn? I um, refer the member for Burke to his statement generally, and that is, of course, if a member finds words offensive, I would require they be withdrawn. In the instance he cites, as every member in the House is aware and as the public ought to be aware, the minister who had made those particular remarks when they were brought to when I became aware of the possible inference in those remarks, the minister was no longer in the chamber, and it was for that reason that I required him to return this morning. I didn't necessarily require him to withdraw the remarks. I would draw the attention of all members of the House to the Hansard of this morning's comments by that minister. Uh, and I will come back to the member for Burke because it is not my intent that anything that causes as much offence as that occurred to the member for, as that caused the member for Dixon should remain on the record. Member for Braddon. Uh, Mr Speaker, I wonder if you would consider uh, introducing digital clocks. Uh, into the chamber to assist members and staff to clearly and quickly determine the time. Such clocks exist in the main committee and are much easier to read than the clocks in this chamber. It's not. I understand the member for Braddon's inquiry and I will in fact respond to him when I have an opportunity. Member for Braddon, I'd, in my experience as, a, as a, an occupier of one of the seats in this House, I did not find the present arrangement at all inconvenient. I am therefore not inclined to facilitate a change, but if he were to raise the matter with the procedure committee and they were to make such a, such a recommendation, I would consider it. I present the Auditor General's audit reports for 2000-2001. Number 18, Performance Audit, Reform of Service Delivery of Business Assistance Programs, Department of Industry, Science and Resources. And number 20, Performance Audit, 
second tranche sale of Telstra shares. The Leader of the House. Move that the reports be printed. The question is that the reports be printed. All those that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, papers are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. De full details of these papers will be recorded in the votes of proceedings in Hansard. I move that the House take note of papers numbers uh, one, two, three and four. The Manager of Opposition Business. So you move the debate be adjourned. The question is the debate be adjourned. The adjourned debate be made in order of the day for a future sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. No ministerial statements.